Well, I can still see uh, a few people in the room, so you're not tired yet. Yeah, I see lots of coffee around, so that's good. You're going to need it, because now we're getting to the really, uh, the more intense stuff, right? Um, and uh, hi again if you're on Twitch. Stay tuned. This is going to be a cool session. So um, let's quickly recap what we learned so far. So first session was an overview of AI services. Um, one of them being uh, Lex that Ian just presented. And pr that's a really cool demo that it did. Um, and uh, as we saw this morning, there's under those uh, application services like Lex and Poly and Recognition, there's a layer of platform services that lets you build more uh, custom solution. Uh, your own models, your own data sets, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, well, one of the most exciting services in there, for me, is definitely Amazon SageMaker. Um, it was launched at reInvent uh, in December, so it's literally uh, two months old. And this is the one we're going to focus on. Uh, we're going to explain what you can do with it, uh, different ways uh, in which you can use it. And as you will see, it, you can go from super simple to more advanced, more custom, and more complicated. So um, whether you're just beginning with machine learning and deep learning, or whether you've been doing this for five or 10 years, uh, there should be something in there for you, OK? So before we actually dive into the service, I want to take a few minutes um, to, uh, to go over what the typical machine learning process looks like. Maybe not everyone in the room is a, is a, a seasoned, uh, pra uh, seasoned machine learning practitioner. So, uh, so let's go over the steps, see what the pain points are, and see how we can solve them. So surprisingly, you know, it should start with a business problem. Okay, uh, I say surprisingly because I still meet a lot of people who want to embark on machine learning projects to see, quote, what the technology is capable of. And I think that's a really dangerous way to get started because, you know, what's the point? You're going to run around in circles building stuff that doesn't really matter to anyone. So how could you even evaluate results, right? So the first thing is, um, what's the business problem, okay? So next time the VP of marketing or whoever, we don't have any VP marketings in the room, right? No, <laughs> didn't think so. But if you are, hi, I love you. Uh, next time one of those persons just shows up to your desk on Monday morning and say, hey, uh, uh, we need a machine learning strategy. That's really cool, you know. Uh, I played golf with a friend and they do cool stuff with machine learning. Uh, you said, yeah, sure, we'd be happy to do that, but just give us a few questions that you would like us to answer, okay? So, unfortunately, AWS can't really help you with that because we don't play golf either, okay? Uh, once you have a question, uh, you need to frame it, okay? So you need to transform this into a, an actual machine learning problem. So the question could be, why are we losing subscribers at an alarming <coughs> rate? Uh, the questions could be, uh, which one of our users should we target with our marketing campaigns because they're the most likely ones to actually react positively to the campaign? Uh, it should be, um, you know, I see uh, I have defects on my manufacturing line and I would like to understand why and how I can sell them, et cetera, et cetera. So once you have the question, you need to frame it, okay? So you need to figure out um, what data you're going to need to answer the problem. Do you have it already? Do you need to start collecting it? Could someone else provide it to you? Could a customer provide you some data that's useful? Could a partner provide some data? Could you buy some open or access some uh, open data out there uh, to solve the problem? Okay? Now, it's, not, it's not always obvious, right? Uh, if you want to predict uh, on which ads Customers are going to click, okay, just look at web logs and the answer's probably in there. But some other problems could be a little trickier to understand and they probably would require multiple data sources, some of which might not be readily available in your company, okay? So you need to understand what to collect, where to collect from, and then you need to integrate it, okay? You need to put all that stuff into a single place when you can start processing it, uh, analyzing it, etc. And 
Well, I guess AWS can help there because we have a pretty extensive data platform, right? So from S3 to uh, Redshift to EMR, et cetera, there are plenty of ways you can store and pre-process the data. <coughs> then when your data set is pretty clean, um, it's time to go into the actual modeling. And if you do traditional machine learning, feature engineering is going to be an important step, okay? So transforming the raw data into actual features that can be used to train a model, okay? If you, if you, work, if you want to work with deep learning models, there's probably less feature engineering, but there's always going to be a bit of tweaking to prepare the data in the best possible format. Then you're going to train the model again and again, right? As we saw this morning, it's not, you can't expect to train just once and get perfect results. So you may have to try a lot of combinations and train again and again and again, train multiple models, select the best ones, okay? And then once you have a working model, of course, the question is, did you answer the question or not, okay? So can you go back to the VP on marketing to say, hey, next time you go play golf, you, here's what you can set your body to impress him, right? So if the answer is no, well, no luck. You have to go back and figure out why the model isn't working and fix it. Right? If it is working fine, then you can deploy it. So you need to push it to probably web servers uh, to perform prediction from uh, your web apps or from your, you know, whatever part of your infrastructure is going to need to answer the question. Okay? And of course, you need to do monitoring and debugging and scaling and capacity planning and all those good things. Right? So there's plenty of work. Right? So like I said, that initial part, framing the problem, you know, you, you can't, I can't really help, we can't really help, you have to talk to the domain experts in the company. The data platform, integration, storing, cleaning, pre-processing, and so on, uh, you have a number of options on AWS to do that, okay? So just choose your weapon, right? That's pretty, uh, pretty easy. Then for the proper machine learning and data science parts, um, we're going to need notebooks, we're going to need training infrastructure, we're going to need prediction infrastructure. Um, it would be cool to have some built-in algos to save time. It would be cool to be able to uh, experiment with many different things um, in the same framework, okay? And that's typically difficult because if some of you do machine learning, you know that there's, most of the time, there's this gap between the data science environment, right, where one team works on some data using their tools and their logic, and they come, up with results, they come up with results, and they build a nice PowerPoint presentation to say, well, we're happy to announce that A-B test number 964 uh, is delivering the best results ever, and everybody's excited. And then it's like, okay, let's push it in production, so there's a handover between the data science team and some software team or DevOps, <coughs> DevOps team and well, they put A-B test 964 into production, and usually two things happen. Uh, results are totally different, and sometimes it just breaks the platform because it's not scalable code if you're working at scale, right? Story of my life, again and again. And you know, there's no ill will anywhere here. It's just that these are two different worlds. They have different mindsets, they have different tools, uh, and, uh, and they have different ways and different object, different goals. And that's a problem, okay? And aligning all those guys is difficult. So if we had a single environment where all these, all these people could actually work and collaborate using the same tools and same technologies, probably it would make our life, everyone's life easier, right? And deployment, it's mostly about infrastructure. Again, if we could seamlessly transition from uh, the training environment to the prediction environment, hopefully we would save a lot of problems, right? So this is exactly the kind of issues that SageMaker uh, is, uh, is solving for all of you. So SageMaker is an end-to-end -end service for machine learning. Um, you can go from uh, experimentation, notebooks, right? The demos that I did this morning used notebooks hosted on Jupyter, on, um, Jupyter notebooks hosted on SageMaker, okay? And those were vanilla notebooks, right? Uh, the good thing is I didn't have to specifically work with infrastructure, just started SageMaker instance. We call them notebook instances. And start 
working with my notebooks, okay? And they're all saved in the same place, and somebody else could access those notebooks and, and collaborate easily, okay? Uh, then you can move from that to, uh, to training, right? Uh, to uh, actually um, deploying managed infrastructure for training, and you will see how easy that is, right? If you're scared about firing up EC2 instances and security groups and VPC settings, etc., fear not. This is going to be much easier. Um, and once the model is trained, you can save it in S3. And by using the same managed infrastructure, you can deploy it to scalable infrastructure for prediction and, uh, and general use in your apps. Okay? So it's very cool. There is really zero infrastructure work required, as you will see. Uh, you can use um, all the tools that you like. So we prepackage some of those, um, MXNet, TensorFlow, uh, PySpark, plus, I would say, Python in general. Okay? These are all off the shelf. Just grab them. You don't need to install TensorFlow or MXNet or anything else. Just go and work. Go and do your work. Okay? But at the same time, if you want to use a different library or if you want to use custom, uh, your custom code, let's say you, over the years your company has written a super clever C++ library for deep learning or, or, or for prediction, you can use that too. I'll show you how. Okay? So like I said earlier, you can go from super easy to super custom. Okay? And you pay by the second. Okay? So easy, like EC2, uh, depending on the instance sizes that you're using for prediction, for training and prediction, well, that's your bill. Okay? So just to recap before we dive in demos, um, there's a build phase where you work with notebooks um, and, uh, and you just ex experiment with data, like I, like I did this morning, really. Um, you can also look at built-in algorithms. I think this is one of the major strengths of uh, SageMaker. I'll show you those. Uh, just to avoid even coding, right, uh, machine learning algos. You can train and deploy literally in one click or one API call different environments with those pre-installed libraries that you see here, okay? Uh, we're also working on a super nice feature called HPO, hyperparameter optimization. So hyperparameters are the parameters for your machine learning or deep learning job, right? We'll see some examples. And it's always difficult to find the right combination, okay? And the most scientific way of doing this today is this, right? Yeah? That's, that's how you do it too, okay? So I'm not that silly. No, I'm just kidding here. There, there are some, I would say, okay, smart ways to go and, and pick hyperparameters, but wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be cool to actually be able to predict the right hyperparameters automatically? Well, this is what we're talking about. Using machine learning to automatically recommend the best hyperparameters for your machine learning jobs. Okay. This is in preview, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be great. Save a lot of time and frustration and money too, because you'll get to train the better models earlier on too. And then deploying. So once you have a model, save it in SageMaker and deploy it to manage infrastructure. Okay, so we're gonna see those three components. Let's look a quick, let's take a quick look under the hood. Uh, so how does that work, right? So all of that stuff, okay, so all of training activities and prediction activities are actually performed by running Docker containers, okay? So, for example, when you want to run, let's say, a TensorFlow job, we're going to fire up an instance for training. We're going to deploy automatically to that instance the TensorFlow container pre-installed, and we're going to run your training script on your data set with that container, okay? Uh, Built-in algorithms work the same. So you don't have to, if you don't know much about Docker, uh, that's okay. Uh, you, don't need to be, uh, you don't need to be a Docker expert at all to use SageMaker, unless you really want to go all the way and use everything custom, as I will show you in my last example. But in general, if you want to work with built-in algos or pre-built environment, et cetera, and I suspect that's gonna be a, a large majority of users, then the only thing that you have to do is say, hey, I want this container 
and this takes about one line of code. So don't worry about it. But okay, be aware that under the hood, this is all driven by Docker. Okay, so the way this works is you're going to write, in the most basic example, you're going to write a bit of code. We call it helper code. Uh, that says basically, hey, I want to use this algo. So let's say I want to use linear regression. Uh, my data lives in S3 in this bucket. So I'm going to define some parameters. I'm going to pass those parameters to a training job with the name of the container image I want to work with. Okay. SageMaker is going to start that instance, deploy the container, apply the parameters, point the algo at your data, etc. Then you wait for a bit. You get some results. You get a model. The model is saved in S3. And then if you want to deploy it, uh, same thing, uh, a few parameters called uh, SageMaker. There's a Python SDK for this. Call SageMaker. Ask SageMaker to deploy the model on 1, 2, 3, 9, 52 instances, right? And again, uh, SageMaker is going to fire up those instances, pull the, the right uh, Docker container for prediction for this specific job, and, and run it. OK? So that's why it's, it's fully, that's why there is really zero setup. You never worry about infrastructure. The only thing that you have to specify, as we will see, is just how many instances you want for training or prediction and what instance types they should be. That's all. That's the only thing you need to to worry about, okay? So pretty cool. Um, a word about customers. Um, so um, Digital Globe, oh, maybe Intuit first. So Intuit, you know, financial, financial company, lots of, uh, lots of data, tons of data, I should say, and tons of data science, obviously. And what they like about SageMaker is precisely the fact that it's one single place when you can do all the work. There's a unique SDK to go from training to deployment to everything else. Um, it's, uh, it's all based on managed infrastructure. So literally, you know, your data science teams, which might not be the best DevOps teams ever, are able to work on their own. Uh, they can just get the job done uh, from experimentation to deployment. Okay, so it just makes everything smoo smoother for everybody. And the quote here is, it's pretty typical from, of, of what we hear from SageMaker customers. Um, Digital Globe, um, it's a satellite uh, imaging company. Uh, and uh, as you probably remember, they were the first uh, customer reference for Snowmobile. Did you remember that one? The truck. Uh, so if you haven't seen that video from reInvent 20, uh, 2016, uh, you have to see it. It's literally a truck. Oh, no, you don't call that a truck, sorry. It's a lorry. All right. <laughs> don't mind me, I'm French. OK, a lorry. I always say, what, what's a truck? OK, a, a lorry, the big one, right? The, the, heavy, the heavy duty one, right? So it's a, lure, it's a lorry full of storage. And you can have up to 100 petabytes of storage in that lorry. OK, so those guys, they have a lot of data, right? Satellite images, can you imagine? And transferring that stuff to AWS, uh, well, that doesn't work too well if you try to do it with the network. So actually, they were the first, uh, the first snowmobile reference. So you order the, tr the lorry. So the lorry shows up to your data center. You plug it in, right? So we have, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's the way it works. Uh, we have massive network connectivity. So then you dump all your data onto the storage systems. That could take a few months if you're really talking about 100 petabytes. And then the lorry drives back to the nearest uh, S3 location, right? And they do the, the opposite. They just dump the data into S3, right? So not everybody has 100 petabytes to transfer every day, hopefully, because uh, you know, that would be a lot of work for us too. But OK, these guys did have that problem. And uh, on the same amount of data, they also run um, um, you know, image uh, classification, image detection, right? satellite images. Don't think that people are looking at them and saying, oh, hey, that's the road, and, here's the, and that's a nice forest here. All that stuff is automated. right? And uh, if you want a smaller scale example, actually, uh, this is pretty cool. This is uh, uh, it's a, an organization called Development Seed. They're based in uh, Washington, DC. And um, they wrote this very, very nice blog post um, that shows you how to do uh, building detection, in this case, um, using satellite images. So they grab satellite images from uh, Mapbox, which is another large AWS customer. 
and, uh, and, some, and some open data maps. Uh, and uh, they label those maps using a, a tool that they developed called Label Maker. It's open source, right? So they build a data, they, annot they annotate the images, they build their data set. And then using SageMaker and a convolutional neural network, they're able to do building detection. Okay, it's, it's a cool post because it really has all the steps so you, you can actually go and grab it and, uh, and replay it yourself, right? You just need to have some, some maps, okay? So very nice. And it's a smaller company, so you know, it's not, I'm guessing they don't have a 500 data scientist over there. So this goes to show you can automate and work at scale even if you don't have uh, a super large team. All right, so let's get to demos. So I wanna show you four different things, um, which I think are illustrations of the four different ways um, you can use SageMaker, the four main uh, use cases that I see. The first one is using a built-in algo. Okay, I'll show you the collection that we have today. We keep expanding it. Um, in this example, I'll show you um, the image classification algo, which is really uh, using a deep learning model for classification. And it, you, can use, you can use it from scratch, train it from scratch, or you can use it pre-trained, right? Remember I showed you this morning the violin example, easy to use pre-trained networks. And to make things a little more interesting, we're going to actually to fine tune it. So we're going to retrain it on a different data set and see what kind of results we can get and how long or not <laughs> it takes to do that, okay? The second way to use SageMaker is by using your own training code, okay? So none of the built-in algos are, are applicable to your uh, business uh, problem. So let's say you have your existing TensorFlow script or your existing MXNet script and you just want to train it and deploy it on managed infrastructure, okay? So I'll show you how to do that. And again, to make things a little more interesting, we'll do distributed training, okay? So we'll train uh, from scratch on a slightly bigger data set with using a couple of powerful instances. And again, you'll see how simple that is. The third example is different. Uh, the third example is, um, is about bringing your own model to SageMaker. So let's say you already trained a TensorFlow model or a scikit-learn model or, uh, or an MXNet model, any kind of model. It's already there. It doesn't matter where you trained it. It could be on AWS. It could be on your own infrastructure. It doesn't matter. You just bring that model and you want to deploy it. Okay? So you don't work with the training uh, module at all. You just deploy it to web servers. Okay? So that's another way of using SageMaker. And the last way, the last example, is to bring your own container. Okay, remember I said all the training and prediction activities take place with containers, so we're more than happy to uh, provide you with a whole bunch of existing containers, but maybe you, wanna, you want to and you have to use yours. Okay, maybe you, you use a library that isn't really supported today by SageMaker, uh, maybe you use a language or an, a very custom environment, right? And uh, you have to encapsulate it in a Docker container. You know, there could be many different reasons why you want to do this. So here, I'll show you how to build your own Docker container with your training code, with your prediction code, and how to integrate it into SageMaker, okay? And this is a more advanced example. And for that kind of thing, yes, you do need to know a little bit about Docker. All right, so let's get to it. So, um, yeah, let's go full screen. Okay, so this is the SageMaker documentation here. And as you can see here, right? Hopefully that's large enough. Uh, you can see the built-in algos, okay? So, in, you find, the, I would say, the usual ones, right? Linear regression, um, XJBoost for classification, image classification, uh, factorization machines, which, which is a more advanced one, uh, popular to, uh, it's popular to build uh, recommendation engines. Um, image classification, we're gonna look at it. Uh, sec to sec uh, which is, it's an LSTM architecture and it's actually with what Sockeye and Amazon Translate use for uh, machine translation. 
k-means is a clustering algorithm, right? So unsupervised learning to group samples into uh, look-alike groups. Uh, PCA, um, so that's, that's usually an algo you use early on if you have a, a very high dimensionality problem. Let's say you have 10,000 features. Could happen, right? Um, you, sure, you could train a model on 10,000 features. That's going to take your time, some time. Maybe that's not necessary. So PCA is actually going to shrink the dimensionality of the problem by reducing uh, your feature set to a smaller feature set. Right? So looking at correlations and so on and eliminating features that are not, uh, not very useful or combining them. Okay? LDA is the, uh, it's a, a natural language processing algo. Uh, it's the one that uh, Amazon Comprehend is based on to build uh, you know, topics and, uh, and score documents on topics. Uh, NTM is another uh, natural language processing algo. Uh, Deep AR is very cool. It's one of the newer ones. This was uh, added since, since launch. Uh, this one uh, works with time series. So if you need to do time series prediction, DPR is going to do that. And Blazing Text, again, it's the latest one. Uh, just added a few, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it helps you build word vectors, right? So if you're familiar with, again, natural language processing, usually one of the early steps is to build uh, word vectors, and that's a super, super intensive process if you have a very large uh, vocabulary. And uh, Blazing Text is going to help you do that at scale. Uh, on that subject, uh, all of these are Amazon implementations. Right? So we didn't go and steal code from anybody, I suppose. So these are implemented by Amazon and AWS Teams. And uh, we believe they are uh, 10x better than reference implementations. Okay, so it could be 10x faster, it could be 10x cheaper. But that's, that's the level we're uh, shooting for. We're trying to build implementations that are just 10x more efficient than whatever you, you may be using today. Okay, so how do you use those? So Here's the SageMaker console, okay? So it all starts by creating a notebook instance, which is as complex as giving it a name, <coughs> choosing a, an instance size. Optionally running this is one of your, in one of your VPCs, <coughs> and then creating it, okay? Wait for a few minutes, and you have one, right? And then you can open it, and voila. Okay, so this is the SageMaker interface. It's a Jupyter Notebook, okay? So um, these instances come uh, with a, a whole ton of uh, uh, SageMaker examples, okay? So some of the notebooks I'm gonna show you are actually part of those examples. Um, again, these highlight all the built-in algos and all the different ways in which you can use SageMaker. And uh, I would say if you're even beginning with machine learning and deep learning, this is a great way to learn, right? If you want to know what XJBoost is all about, well, um, looking at the XJBoost notebook for classification is actually a good way to understand that. And look at how it's used and, and just run the notebook. And, you know, for me, it usually becomes clear, okay? All right, so let's start with our first example, okay? So again, this one is image classification. So I need to grab the, the, the algo for this. Uh, I want to use the pre-trained uh, deep learning network, and I want to retrain it, fine-tune it, and this technique is called transfer learning, because you're transferring learning, I guess, from an existing model into a new one, uh, in order to get better results, all right? So let's, so the model that I'm going to use Okay, he's hosted in a Docker container. So today's SageMaker is available in four regions, as you can see here. And this means that there's gonna be a container for each algo in each region, okay? So that's the one line of code I was talking about. Okay, this is how I select the name for that, uh, uh, for that Docker container. Okay, so I want the image classification container available in the region where I'm running, which I suppose is US East 1 as usual, okay? All right, so that's done, right? This is how I select my algo off the shelf. Okay, so what's in there? So as we will see in the parameters, um, this container actually stores a pre-trained version of ResNet, which is one of the powerful um, 
convolutional neural network uh, for image classification. And you can use them in pre-trained form or not. It's one, one of the choice we'll have to make. All right? OK, so that's it. I selected my container here. Now, I want to fine tune on this data set here. OK, so let's, if you're not familiar with CIFAR, OK, it's called CIFAR 10. It got 60,000 images. They're color images in 10 categories. That's why, that, that's why it's called CIFAR 10. And what's interesting about this one is there, these are really tiny images, 32 by 32 pixels, OK? And um, this makes them pretty hard to learn. So it's a, it's a good data set to work with because it's not huge, but at the same time, it's pretty challenging. And, you know, I dare you to correctly classify some of the cats and some of the dogs, you know, 32 by 32. Some of them make no sense, right? So, yes, airplanes and uh, birds, hopefully we can, we can figure it out. But some of the images are really, really difficult, okay? Which is good because it's going to show us how good or bad the network uh, is, okay? So I just need to download it, right? So I'm downloading the data set, uploading it to S3. Nothing really complicated here. And now I get to the really important part. So I didn't write any deep learning code because I'm going to reuse that built-in algo, but I still need to give some parameters, okay? So these are the hyperparameters for the algo. So here's what I'm going to do. So I, like I said, this deep learning uh, network is ResNet, and it comes in many depths, okay? So here I can pick from a, a number of sizes. I'm going to take 50 layers, which is kind of a middle value, hopefully not too long to train, okay? I need to specify the image shape, okay? Remember, we saw that this morning. So color images, so three channels, okay? And actually, in this data set that I downloaded, images have been shrunk for obscure reasons to 28 by 28, which makes them even more difficult to use, right? But fine, okay? It could be 332, 32 if we use the original data set. Uh, I need to uh, indicate the number of training samples, so 50K, okay? And 10K for, uh, for uh, validation. I've got 10 classes, right? You just saw them. The batch size that I want to use for this data set. So this is one of the... Uh, scientific decisions we have to make. So 128, why not, right? Uh, it could be 32, it could be 64. Why don't you try all three, right? And uh, yell at me on Twitter saying I wasted your time and your money, okay? Or you could use 128. I'm gonna fine tune for 10 epochs. Remember what an epoch is. It's going through the full data set once, batch by batch, right? Slice by slice. Um, that's a very low number. Right, um, which is good, because it means training is going to be short and it's going to be inexpensive, which are the two main reasons why transfer learning is a popular technique. Okay, We'll see another reason later on. But you could say, hey, all those deep learning gurus, right? they train those crazy ResNets on very large data sets. Uh, actually, they've been trained on ImageNet, right? so millions and millions of images. So good, you know, they did all the hard work for me. So I just want to train for 10 epochs. And maybe that's enough for this network to, to specialize you know, in that CIFAR 10 data set. That's the basic idea, right? Reuse the knowledge from the existing training and just apply a little more training. OK, learning rate, again, one of those scientific parameters. And this one, which is important, okay? like I said, we could say, no, don't use the pre-trained model, learn from scratch. We're going to do that later, actually. Uh, but here, you know, I'm lazy, I want to reuse it. OK, and that's it. So uh, I need to input all those parameters into a JSON document, because you know, it's AWS. So we love JSON, right? So do you, I know. I know you love them. <laughs> Uh, you can't kill JSON, as you know, right? So uh, these are the training parameters for the job. So the algo container, uh, how many instances we want. So it should be a fairly short job. So one GPU instance should be enough, right? Um, the hyperparameters that we just defined, right? Number of layers, number of samples, et cetera, et cetera. OK. And then where does the data live? So my training data is here in S3. 
and my validation data is here in S3. Okay? So when you work with built-in algos, that's it. Pick one, put your data in S3, select parameters for the algo, write that nice and sexy JSON document with all that information plus location of data, and that's it. Right? So you definitely don't need to be a deep learning expert to do this. And then, using the SageMaker SDK, you create the job. Okay? And, well, that's going to fire up one of those P2 instances, right? Deploy the image classification container to it. Uh, point it are you at your data in S3. Let it do its thing. Wait for a bit and get a trained model. See? So, uh, in, the, in the interest of time, I did this already. Uh, we'll, we'll look at the training times uh, earlier. I believe this one took, I think it took 17 minutes, but we'll check, okay? Actually, I might have the console here. Jobs. Oh, six, no, it's that one here. Six, 17 minutes, okay? Right? So that could be long or short, depending on where you come from. But remember, you did nothing, right? So you can do something else in the, in, in the meantime. You don't have to do anything. You just wait for the result, okay? All right, so my model is available. Uh, I can see it. I save it in SageMaker, right? So I get a whole lot of information. Uh, yeah, that one. So I, can, I could download the model from S3, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I could do all kinds of things here. But what I'm mostly interested in is looking at the training log, okay? So I get that in CloudWatch logs, and I see, and I'm sorry if that's a bit small, and now it's a bit large. It's like hyperparameters, right? They're always too small or too large. I see that epoch nine, which is the 10th epoch, brings me to, I don't see anything really. Yeah, so it, it got to 86.9% training accuracy, and 75.5 validation accuracy. Remember that number, okay? 10 epochs, each epoch 34 seconds. Okay, let's, I'll give you 35. So 350 seconds of training, which stands, okay, let's say we'll agree on six minutes, right? Okay. Uh, but, you know, that's six minutes of training, but there's more time to start the instances and shut them down, et cetera, okay? But uh, this, is the actual, uh, this is the actual training time about six minutes of computation. Okay, and now uh, I can plot. I've got those logs in CloudWatch logs. So using my fancy uh, Python skills, I can actually plot the training accuracy and the validation accuracy over the different epochs. And both are kind of going up. So I could say, yeah, okay, not, not too bad, right? And you know, validation accuracy is not really going up so much, so there might, you know, might not be a good idea to train even further. I don't think we would get much better results. Okay, so 75.5%. So now I want to deploy, so I want to save that model in, uh, in S3. I'm going to use the uh, create model API to do that. Okay, that's very fast. Then I'm going to create an endpoint configuration because I want to deploy my model to uh, an HTTP endpoint. And what this really means is selecting how many instances you want for prediction and what size they should be, all right? So here, just one M4 X large will do. Um, you could do A-B testing, right? You could de deploy multiple uh, models behind the same endpoint. Uh, so this could be different versions of the same model or they could be different models altogether. Uh, and that would allow you to do uh, beta testing, uh, and uh, sorry, A-B testing on the models to see which one performs better. So if you want to do green-blue deployment on models, for example. This, this is the way. All right, so just a little more JSON and then create the endpoint. Okay, and this takes about, again, 10, 10 minutes or something. Create the instance, deploy it, deploy the model. And from then on, we can predict, right? Uh, so let's try it. Okay, so let's just grab some images from from the internet. Unable to establish SSH connection. That's a good one. All right. <coughs> Let's try another one. All right. Okay. 
So it's, it, oh, it's a lorry. It's a lorry. Two lorries. Two. Two lorries. Right? Plural. I-E-S. Man, I'm back in high school. All right. And, well, that's one of the categories in Cypher 10, isn't it? So, yeah, even though the silly Americans call them trucks. Okay, so let's predict. So here I'm going to use the invoke endpoint SDK API. Okay, so I know it looks like a function call, right? Because we're using the SDK. But we're really performing an HTTP call here. Okay, this could be done uh, outside, completely outside of SageMaker, and you could use... A, 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 a proper HTTP request from your own app to do this, okay? So, looks like a function call, but we are really invoking an API here. Okay, so we need to have the right uh, content type. It's an image, and yeah, let's just go for it. Okay, pretty good. 99.78%, it's a truck, right? Good results, actually, because it's a bit of a complex image anyway, because we have two objects in there. Let's try the dog again, come on. Yes, thank you. All right. Yeah, dogs. We have enough cats on the internet. Okay, good score as well, right? Okay, let's try, let's try more. Come on, let's do all of them. Bird. Okay. And this is where it might get weird. No, very good, 96. Okay. Once it told me this was a deer. I was a bit confused. <laughs> and yeah, let's try the horse. See if we can go four on four for four. Ah, it's a deer. <laughs> All right, so that one's wrong. Uh, and actually, let's look at the horse probability. So the deer is here. And OK, yeah, it's only 11% of the horse. OK, so all right. three. You know, three out of four in bad, right? 75%, right? See? It is. Thank you. Thank you. It was exposed to space radiation. That's, that's the reason. Okay, I need a new category for space deers. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah, 75%, right? That's the accuracy I got. So, hey. And remember, I didn't train for very long, right? I trained for a few minutes. So... Pretty good. Now, let's move on to a different example. Let's move on to training from scratch with the same data set. Okay, we're going to use Cypher 10 again, because it's fun. Uh, but we're going, to try, uh, we're going to try and learn it on a ResNet, okay? Uh, very similar to the previous one. But this time we're bringing in our own training script, okay? So we're going to bring our um, MXNet code, okay? And this one is actually using Gluon, the Gluon API. I'm gonna say a word about this, okay? And we're going to do distributed training as well, okay? And let's see where we land. So a word about Gluon. So Gluon is a more recent API in MXNet. Uh, I showed you this morning the symbolic part. Remember, we use the symbol APIs to stack those layers, okay? Um, and this is a good way of doing things. One of the problems with the symbolic way is that uh, it's not super flexible. Let me explain. As you, as you saw, the, 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 the process was very, very uh, sequential. Uh, we have to define the model, fine, and then we train it and we wait for results and we don't have a lot of visibility, you know, we have to wait for results. We can't really inspect what's going on during training. We, okay, we have some logs, but we can't really see what's happening inside the layers. So it's a bit of a black box way of, uh, of building and training models. Okay, TensorFlow is the same. Uh, it's called uh, symbolic programming. So first you define a symbol, right? Or define symbols into a graph, an execution graph. Then you can optimize the graph, and that's the main advantage of sim symbolic uh, programming is that the, the execution graph is predefined, so you can optimize uh, speed and memory uh, for, on it. But then, once you launch the actual execution, in our case, the training process, you, it's a bit of a black box, and you have to wait until the end to get results. Okay, so 
Uh, if you're in a production phase where you're sure about the model and you're sure it's going to perform, good. That's the way to go. You're going to get great performance. But when you're experimenting actually, and building some maybe a tweaking networks, you want to know exactly what's going on. So at each training step, you want to be able to inspect uh, the weights in a specific layer. Maybe you want to modify those weights. Uh, you know, and generally, you want to work uh, with full control over the training process. And this is called uh, imperative programming, which is just the way we've been programming forever using you know, Python and Java and C, et cetera. Okay? Um, just define the execution flow with instructions okay? instead of defining a graph and then running uh, code on that graph. So Gluon um, is, is a layer on top of MXNet that lets you do that, that lets you do imperative programming and specifically, um, you can build, you can still build networks. I'm just going to show you a few, a few parts here. You can still build networks in a, in a simple way. Where's the, where's the net function? Uh, come on. So you can still define, oh no. Yeah, here it is. Ah, it's probably imported. No, it's imported. I can't show it to you. So well, we have we have a pre-built function here to uh, actually uh, uh, to actually build uh, the ResNet. And let me just show you the training loop. Okay, remember in uh, here it is. Uh, and that's a bit. Come on, yeah. Come on, ah, no. Okay, here it is. Okay, so remember how we did it with the symbolic API. We defined this, the symbols. And then we call uh, model.fit, and we just wait. Okay, so here, um, as you can see, you have full control over the control loop. So you know you can iterate over epochs, you can iterate over batches specifically, uh, you can specifically run backward propagation, etc., etc., etc. Back propagation, sorry. So. You can really run this as you would run normal code. You can debug it. You can use the Python debugger, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So the training loop looks a little more complicated than model.fit, right? But, and it's like, yeah, well, actually, the symbolic way looked much simpler. That was my initial reaction. But um, when you need to debug this thing and when you need to understand what's going on and if you're a, if you're a researcher and you need to work with you know, more innovative and, and new network architectures, actually, this is a better way, okay? Um, all right, so enough on Gluon. Uh, I'll point you to the, to the website. So it could be Gluon, it could be Symbolic MXNet, it could be TensorFlow, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, here, as like I said earlier, we have a pre-built MXNet environment for you to use your scripts, okay? So how cool is that line of code? I mean, I love that. Just create an MXNet object from, from your notebook, pass the script, say, hey, I want two instances, and since I'm not paying my bills, let's go for P216XL, right? That's 32 GPUs total, yeah, right? Well, actually, I could have used P3, but I didn't want to show off. So, yeah, and that's it. This is how you will fire up two instances uh, they will get a copy of the data set. Here, we're going to fully replicate the data set because it's small. Okay? For larger data sets, we can shard them. Okay? So we could define a sharding key to split um, the training samples across instances. Um, but here, it's small enough that we can easily replicate it. Okay? And hey, here's the training log. So let's go all the way up. So 50 epochs. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. Yeah, that's faster, all right. So I can see my two instances starting here. And, okay, some parameters, right? So red is one instance and green in a, is another one which prompts the question, if I fire up 16 instances, will I run out of colors? <laughs> I need to try it. Uh, it could be pretty colorful in there. All right, so I see those jobs firing up. And I see my epochs going by, okay? And I, I can see I'm, I'm actually starting with pretty low accuracies, right? Because again, I am learning from scratch, okay? Uh, if I showed you the pre-trained example earlier on, the, actually the, the validation accuracy for the first epoch is already in the 70s, okay? 
because it's a pre-trained model. Here, we start from scratch. So we go all the way down. Uh, we can see one epoch here lasts 11 seconds. Okay? I'm learning a lot of samples per second. But keeping in mind, I have 32 GPUs working here. OK, so let's take the elevator again. And well, OK, this is where I end up, right? Remember what we got for the fine tuning example? We got 75.5% <coughs> in six minutes, right? Something like that. Here, OK, we have 11 seconds per epoch, but we have 50 epochs. Um, so that's a bit of time. And plus, we have uh, 32 GPUs instead of eight. OK? So I'll let you figure out, yes, the, the minute per GPU, blah, blah, blah cost. Absolutely. It's a very good point. Thank you. Forgot to mention that. It's one of the important things is that you fire them up, and then they shut down automatically. So you, you, of course, you stop paying when they shut down, OK? Um, which is a typical problem when you build even EMR clusters or, or I would say data clusters in general, you fire them up, you load the data, and you're kind of reluctant to ch shut them down every few minutes, right? Uh, with SageMaker, you don't have that problem, right? So I get to 73.2 accuracy. So again, this prompts the question, why would I ever do that, okay? Um, I'm, uh, I'm running for longer on much more GPUs. So this has to be quite more costly than my previous attempt. And yet, I don't get a good result. It's OK, but I got a better result with the, with the fine tuning example. So this goes to show transfer learning is super powerful. OK? Uh, and th it's, it's the number one technique that people use to get started on image processing. Because training from scratch is difficult. <coughs> so now imagine training from scratch on ImageNet, which is millions of images. That's, that's a nightmare, right? You're going to run for days, realize, oh, no, that's not good. I got to stop it, fire up again, et cetera. So that's why people love fine tuning. OK? All right, let's quickly look <clears throat> at a couple of additional examples. Um, I'll just point you to the relevant parts. So this one is example three. I've got a pre-trained model, uh, pre-trained TensorFlow model, OK? And uh, so here, it's trained in the notebook, but let's pretend you know, it, this was already available uh, in my infrastructure, OK? Uh, so blah, 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 blah. So that's training, but it's not SageMaker training. It's training locally in the notebook. So I could import that model. OK, which is literally uh, grabbing the model file that you got from TensorFlow, copying it to S3, right? <coughs> Importing it into SageMaker, right? Like this. Saying, hey, uh, this was trained. Fine. Um, just grab it, OK? Don't train, just grab it. So you can reuse, right? If your problem is deploying models at scale, you can take those models and just put them in there. This will work for the deep learning libraries. This will also work for the uh, built-in algos. Let's say you have a pre-trained XJBoost model in scikit-learn, right? You have your classifier. You're happy with it. You don't want to train again. Uh, you can export the models from scikit-learn. And if it's in the right format, which is explained in documentation, you can then inject it into the container for that built-in algo. OK, so it's not just for libraries. It does work for built-in algos, too. So the only thing I need to do here is literally create the endpoint, right? Which, which is pretty simple, OK? Just call deploy, and how many instances do I want, and dot, job done. And then I can predict some samples, OK? So another way to use it, right? As you can see, people tend to believe it's like, we call it end-to-end -end machine learning, and, and we'd be more than happy if you used it end-to-end, because -end, we think it's going to make your life simpler. But if you want to use just parts of that, right? fine. That works, too, as you can see. Um, and this is one of the uh, uh, sample notebooks in SageMaker. So you can run this yourself. And last but not least, going full custom. Okay, So none of the built-in algos work for you. None of the. Uh, 
uh, uh, built-in environments work for you, just want to have your own thing. So this is where you need to know a bit about Docker. Okay, so, and this notebook does a great job as actually <laughs> explaining all of this. So yeah, creative writer, lots of explanation. Uh, let me just point out one thing, which is the, the important thing here. Is, yeah, the important thing here. Obviously, this is going to plug into SageMaker. So there needs to be some kind of interface. SageMaker needs to be able to invoke your training script whoops, and your prediction script. Okay? So you need to follow this convention. Okay? It's in the SageMaker doc. So the, the, the layout and the file names inside of your container need to, uh, need to respect that. Right? kind of makes sense um, if, you, if you think about it. So, once you have that container, well, you can build it, right? You need a Docker file. So if you don't know Docker, just close your eyes. That's going to be over in a minute, OK? Uh, so you need a Docker file. Just build the container, push it to an ECR repository. ECR is the Docker registry service inside of AWS, right? So just push it to, uh, to a repo. If you don't have a repo, create one, OK? Yeah, close your eyes. It's going to be over soon. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, done. OK, and, and then we're back into familiar territory, OK? Now we have a container. It has the right layout. We know how to train with it. We know how to predict with it. So we're back into, uh, uh, we're back into the world of the living, and we can just upload the data to S3, select a container just like we did in the previous examples, except this time it's ours. And we can start a training job on a C4 instance, and we can deploy it with just one API call, on, again, on an M4 instance, and we can predict with it. OK, so the rest of the workflow is completely similar. OK? So these are the four main ways in which I think you can use uh, SageMaker. All right? Uh, I'm sure you'll find some creative ways to, to use it differently, differently, which is fine. But keep that in mind, you know, built-in algos, super simple, no machine learning coding required, just throw parameters and data at the algo, job done. Uh, if you're already using one of those environments, like MXNet, Gluon, uh, TensorFlow, et cetera, uh, fine, just uh, bring your code and throw it at the proper uh, container. If you have an existing model that was trained outside of SageMaker, that works too. And you can even bring your own container to build everything custom and just enjoy managed infrastructure for training and prediction. OK, so some uh, additional resources. Some of them I've already shared this morning. Um, I want to point out, if you want to, uh, so we're uh, actually recording, so that might not be useful. But I did shoot a, a YouTube video on, uh, on SageMaker explaining those four use cases again. And uh, I've been. Uh, actively writing about SageMaker uh, recently. So uh, you will find on, the, on my blog additional examples of, uh, yeah, so Gluon, if you want to know more about Gluon, that's my last article. Uh, I did write about uh, the deep AR built-in algo for time series, if you're, if you're curious about that one. And I did write about factory resistant machines to build a movie recommender, too. So. Uh, just to show you how to get into the uh, built-in algo groove, I guess. Uh, so feel free to try this and, uh, and send me feedback. Uh, yell at me on Twitter. I love it. Okay? All right. And if you build cool stuff, just share it with me. I'm more than happy to retweet. Okay? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully, Deep Lens is still working, so we can uh, try that one out in the next session. Thank you very much.